At first, I wasn't wanting to. Like, we were in our garage through one of the doors, just like waiting. Like, hammer thing. And then, like, a hammer thing with an axe at the She wasn't, like, alive. And oh, beautiful. Got the whole top of her head. In a shocking tale that defies belief, two 13-year-olds committed the unthinkable. They plotted and carried out the murder of their grandmother for a mere $155. Join us as we delve into the chilling details of this horrific crime and explore the complex questions it raises about the depths of human darkness. The murder of Barbara Olson by Antonio Barbu and Nathan Pape was a senseless and horrific crime that deeply affected the community of Sheboygan, Wisconsin. The crime details are chilling. Such acts of violence committed by individuals so young are difficult to comprehend and elicit strong emotions of shock and disbelief. The sentences imposed on Barbu and Pape reflect the severity of their actions and the legal consequences they faced as adults. Barbu received a sentence of 36 years in prison, while Pape was sentenced to life imprisonment. No amount of time served in prison can bring back Barbara Olson or alleviate the profound pain enjoyed by her family and friends. The crime and convictions. How did you guys get to Theo's Pizza? It's not that far of a walk. So you just walked? Yeah, it's not that far. About how far? Probably uh, about a 30 minute walk. And who paid for that? Butcher Nate's, we had a $20. And where did you get that, do you know? I remember we found that on the floor at his house. We have video evidence. We have a lot of stuff, okay? And I'll tell you right now, you're not telling me the truth. The arrest and convictions of Antonio Barbu and Nathan Pape for first-degree intentional homicide underscore the seriousness of their actions. The fact that they were both just 13 years old at the time of the crime makes it even more unsettling and prompts us to question the factors that contributed to such a violent act. Understanding how individuals, particularly young ones, can engage in such heinous crimes requires an examination of the complex interplay of various factors. Personal experiences, such as exposure to violence or trauma, can significantly impact an individual's behavior and decision-making process. Furthermore, the social environment in which individuals grow up plays a crucial role. Influences from family, peers, and the wider community can shape their attitudes, values, and coping mechanisms. Mental health and emotional well-being are also important considerations. Undiagnosed or untreated mental health issues can impair judgment and exacerbate impulsive or aggressive behavior. Emotional struggles such as anger, resentment, or a lack of empathy may also contribute to violent acts. It is essential to approach such cases with a nuanced understanding that acknowledges human behavior's complexity and the many factors that can lead individuals, even young ones, to commit violent acts. While it is shocking and difficult to comprehend, it is crucial to recognize that criminal behavior does not arise in a vacuum, and addressing the root causes is crucial for prevention and intervention efforts. Sentencing and just punishment. I just want to say that I'm truly sorry for everything that happened. I truly regret every single thing that happened that day. Every single day that went by, I wish I could go back in time to stop everything from happening. That's it. I know I don't show my emotions much, and I'm, I myself am not sure why, but that doesn't mean I don't. The severity of the crimes committed by Barbu and Pape is reflected in the sentences they received. Barbu's 36-year prison term and Pape's life imprisonment with parole eligibility after 30 years demonstrate the gravity of their actions and the need to hold them accountable. These sentences aim to serve several purposes, including ensuring that the perpetrators face the consequences of their crimes, protecting society from potential future harm, and deterring others from committing similar acts of violence. However, it is essential to recognize that no amount of time spent in prison can fully compensate for the loss of Barbara Olsen's life or alleviate the immense pain endured by her family and friends. While the justice system can provide a sense of closure and accountability, it cannot undo the irreversible damage caused by the crime. The tragic impact on the victim's loved ones is immeasurable, and their grief and suffering cannot be resolved solely through legal measures. Society needs to acknowledge the justice system's limitations in addressing the profound emotional and psychological effects of such devastating loss. 
supporting the victims' families in their healing process, providing access to counselling and mental health services, and fostering a compassionate and understanding community are crucial steps towards assisting them in coping with their grief and trauma. The limitations of the justice system. And why, why was this done? At first, I wasn't wanting to. Like, we were in our garage through one of the doors, just like waiting. All right, um, where did you get this small ax or whatever that you were talking From about? From my garage. From your garage? And where did Nathan get that hammer? I think that was just in his house. While serving an essential purpose in holding offenders accountable, the criminal justice system has inherent limitations when it comes to addressing the emotional and psychological toll experienced by the victim's loved ones. While necessary for justice and retribution, sentences and punishments often fail to provide comprehensive support for the trauma and grief inflicted upon the victims and their families. Society should prioritize providing resources and services that address the emotional needs of those affected. Access to counseling and mental health support can provide a crucial role in helping victims' families navigate complex emotions, cope with grief, and find ways to rebuild their lives after such devastating loss. Community resources such as support groups or victim advocacy organizations can provide a network of understanding and support to assist the healing journey. Moreover, efforts to reform the justice system should focus on rehabilitation and restorative justice practices. These approaches prioritize repairing the harm caused by the crime, promoting accountability, and facilitating the reintegration of offenders into society. By engaging both offenders and victims in dialogue and addressing the underlying causes of the crime, restorative justice can provide a more holistic approach that acknowledges the needs and perspectives of all parties involved. The importance of prevention and intervention Prevention and intervention are crucial to address the root causes of violent behaviour in young individuals. Punishment alone is not enough. Comprehensive prevention strategies such as early intervention programs, mental health services, trauma-informed approaches, community support and education are needed to reduce violence and create lasting change. Identifying and addressing risk factors in young individuals can prevent violent behavior. Targeted programs offer support and alternatives to at-risk youth, equipping them with tools to make positive choices and preventing issues from escalating. Early intervention is crucial for prevention efforts. Mental health plays a significant role in preventing violence. Many acts of violence stem from untreated mental health conditions, trauma, or emotional distress. Providing accessible and comprehensive mental health services is essential for identifying and addressing underlying issues contributing to violent behavior. By offering early intervention and treatment, we can support young individuals in managing their mental health and reducing the risk of engaging in violent acts. Addressing trauma is another critical aspect of prevention. Trauma can have a profound impact on an individual's development and behavior. Trauma-informed care and support are crucial in helping young people process and heal from their experiences. By addressing trauma and providing appropriate interventions, we can reduce the likelihood of violent reactions triggered by unresolved pain and emotional distress. Fostering supportive communities is vital to preventing violence among young individuals. Building strong community networks and support systems can give young people a sense of belonging, connection and stability. Engaging in community activities, mentorship programs and positive role modeling can help young individuals develop healthy relationships, social skills and a sense of empathy. By fostering a sense of community and belonging, we can create an environment less conducive to violence. Education plays a vital role in decreasing violence, as it helps instill empathy and non-violent ways of resolving conflicts. Education can shape attitudes and behaviors that reject violence as a solution by dispelling myths and stereotypes about violence. It is necessary to address systematic issues like poverty, inequality, and access to resources to prevent violence. We can help alleviate desperation and frustration that may lead to violent behavior by providing young individuals with opportunities, resources, and support. Stay tuned for our next video. You're 15 years old. You cannot lie to me. I will drag you down with this if you start lying with me. I need you to be 100% honest. Was Nick there? Yes. You sure? Who else is in the living room with you? Nick. Then when he got there, the lights were still on, and he said he fell asleep. I've been calling my parents all day, and they hadn't been done, so... He hasn't talked to him since, like, six yesterday. Did you have a gun? No. Are you sure? Have you ever seen him carrying a real gun? 
Yeah, no, I don't want this to come back and bite you. I had you open the garage door. That is good. He pulls the car keys out of his jacket. Did you talk to your brothers at all? No. Nick told his little brother to keep the door unlocked for him to come in last night. We discovered his dad on the couch, like bloody. His face was really pale. You don't want to start lying to me right now. You called home and talked to Greg at one point last night? Nine, ten. Because you will go to jail for the rest of your life. I think you had something to do with what happened tonight. The more you lie, the deeper it gets. There is no lesser punishment you're offering me if I come up with a reason. These are the words of a deranged teenage killer, challenging the detectives after slaying his entire family. This is the story of a deranged boy who ruthlessly shot his mum, dad and two younger brothers. Nicholas Wagner Browning, born in 1992, hails from the Baltimore suburb of Cockeysville, Maryland. His father, John, was an attorney and his mother, Tamara, was a homemaker. He had two younger brothers, 13-year-old Gregory and 11-year-old Benjamin. On February the 8th, 2008, when Nick Browning, his three friends, Ryan Fingles, Taylor Tewksbury and Alexander Smith arrived at his home, they immediately knew something was unusual. At first glance, the house looked like it had been burglarized, but later, they discovered that Nick's entire family was shot dead as they were sleeping in their beds. The possibility of a burglary was discarded with respect to the circumstantial evidence. Nick and his three friends were taken into custody, as they were the key witness and, to a great extent, the prime suspects. They were separated into three different interrogation rooms. Nick's three friends were considered crucial witnesses in this case, as Nick, for the majority of the day of the unfortunate event and the following day with his friends. Considering the brutality and immaturity of the murder, the interrogation was analyzed by licensed attorneys and clinical psychologists. All the witnesses and suspects being juveniles, the detectives had to be careful to make sure they understood their rights. It's no wonder the teenagers would be nervous and frightened as it was a mass murder case. So the cops interacted very casually with the four boys to create a rapport with them from the beginning. They tried to come across as friendly, so they might be less inclined to lie. My name's Dave. What's your name, Ryan? After gathering basic information from the boys, detectives learned that the four boys were sleeping over at Ryan's house that night. You guys spent the entire evening together yesterday? Yes. The detective sat with Nick very closely when compared to the others, wherein he was intentionally invading his personal space to make him focus on him. It is a psychological approach because it is more difficult to lie to someone who's inches from your face looking directly at you. Ryan explains that Nick temporarily left the sleepover for a few hours as he planned to sneak home to get the car from his house, just a few miles away from Ryan's house. Nick had plans to drive back and take the boys for a ride, but it didn't happen because the lights were still on when he got there, so he just sat in the car and fell asleep. However, the detectives could identify that the teen's story was a cooked up one and seemed illogical. If any intruder had invaded the house, they could have robbed as well, and they will never let the lights on. The interrogation session with Nick Browning was creepy from the beginning itself. He showed no emotions or frustrations. It was shocking to learn how casually Nick talked about his parents and brothers, given that he just found them dead. And I went upstairs the first of my mother and my two brothers. I saw them. Nick intentionally gave an erroneous timeline of events so that it doesn't line up with him being at the house when his family was killed. The officers continued questioning him about the gun locker in the house in the basement. Gun locker in the house? In the base basement. What kind of guns your dad has? Two pistol, a 40 caliber, 9mm. Nick was outright giving explicit details of the type of guns that his father had. With this question and his answer, police established that Nick knew enough about the gun locker. So it gives hints that Nick could potentially use the guns inside it and him being the shooter gains probability. Nick Browning was a smart student, as his friends affirm, but his addiction to drinking doesn't typically align with the profile of a good student. But emotional stress can often throw children to seek ways to cope with that excess pressure. Many such students have insane parents who set excessively high expectations for their kids. Nick's friend Alex pointed out a troubled relationship between Nick and his dad due to his bad habits. The officers tried to take down Nick by telling him that his friends had ratted him out and that they had received information about his past mistakes. When asked about this, Nick seemed mature and well composed in his answers. He said you had a good relationship with your dad. Was he hard on you at all or anything like that? My best. I mean, yeah, we've had our issues, but. Okay. 
He told that though his parents used to warn him to stay away from alcohol and other stuff, they never crossed the limits to torture him or restrict him from enjoying his life. Nick was moving wisely, making every effort to avoid speculation of him committing the murder. He was more than happy to share with the cops his encounters with his parents while he was caught drinking and roaming outside. He presented the rapport with his family so beautifully that it never felt like he had a grudge towards any of them for interfering in his life. I love my family. They provide me with everything I want. They're still there. I love them. Visibly, there was no reason for him to kill his family, and that's what confused the detectives. Nick also demanded food and water during the breaks. It was extremely bizarre to find someone eating and drinking in peace who had just lost his entire family in the worst way. The camera footage in the interrogation room showed that when Nick was left alone, he relaxed and slept while keeping his legs over the officer's chair. When asked why he is impassive about losing his dear ones, he questioned, so I don't show emotion, that condemns me? The detectives decided to tighten the questioning pattern and begin listing the evidence that zeroes out the possibility of burglary in the house. There's no other explanation. Nobody broke into this house. It was you. You left your friends. They also pointed out that a set of keys were discovered on his bed. Nick faced all these allegations with ease. He argued that the chance of burglary could not be ruled out only because something expensive was not robbed. He also mentioned that more than two sets of keys are in the house, and finding one on his bed is not unusual. The high school student stood emotionless, and he was confident that a jury would believe his story that burglars were responsible for the killings. Then the cops accused him of killing his parents to claim the insured amount, and scared of sharing it, he killed his brothers. Nick also denied this story, saying why should he kill his parents for money, as he will eventually inherit their properties, which is enough and to spare for him to lead a luxurious life. There's no reason for me to kill my love. They provide me with everything I want. But they were stripped. The detectives found no other way to make Nick confess and plead guilty. At last, they asked him directly to explain the reason for slaying his family. Nick frankly asked the officers what was the point of giving a reason. Nick realized that he will be ultimately sent to jail whether or not he reveals the motive. Finally, the detective applies the re-technique of mitigating circumstances or alternatives. The officer explained that people do things for reasons, sometimes impacting outcomes. This may prompt the suspect to confess and feel less judged. We talk to people every day who love their wives, love their children, love their babies, love their friends, and they sit right where you're sitting. But things happen, we're human beings, things upset people. He will also make the suspect believe that there will be room for justification for his actions. The officers also asked Nick whether he wanted to be known as a cold-blooded killer or a killer made out of the situation. They were expecting Nick to hold on to the less morally reprehensive alternative and explain the situations that led him to commit the mass murder. The idea worked out, and after much contemplation, Nick confessed. Nick covered his face almost the entire time he explained the killing spree. He was very mad at me that night. I saw him sitting on the couch. The TV was on. I knew that the gun was out on the workshop bench. I went between putting the gun up to his head and pulling it back, down and up. I'm not sure if I meant to pull the trigger, it just went off. I realized I just couldn't walk away from that and then I shot my mum. No one was there to say anything that my story would go because I was the only one. Nick might have had antisocial personality disorder, otherwise he could have made this decision purely based on his desire to satisfy his immediate needs. Maybe he desperately wanted freedom to be an independent adult, so he decided to eliminate the hurdles in his way. Individuals with antisocial personality disorder will not react to this intervention from parents as a typical team would, like arguing, rebelling, sneaking out, maybe defying their parents. Nick was sentenced to four life terms for killing his parents and younger brothers. What do you think about Nick who committed the quadruple homicide? Do you think traumatic parenting could have made him a psychopath, or is he born with killer instincts? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, and subscribe to our channel to unveil more terrifying reactions in the courtroom. Until next time, goodbye.